So what we know is that uh, in the immediate aftermath of the bomb in Hiroshima, uh, and we know this from having been present ourselves in, in the weeks that followed uh, the explosion in Hiroshima, uh, out of 300 doctors present in Hiroshima, 270 had died. Out of 1,700 nurses, 1,600 had been killed. And out of some 140 pharmacists, 120 had been killed. So you can imagine the situation when the ICRC, so we, we were, our doctors uh, and delegates, happened upon the scene in Hiroshima. There, there was no uh, uh, medical personnel or infrastructure, virtually none left mm -hmm. to take care of the tens of thousands of people who were dying and injured and in desperate need of help. Uh, miraculously, the Japanese Red Cross Hospital stood standing uh, in the debris, and it had been built in stone, so it somehow with, withstood the blast, although its windows were all blown out, and crucially, its uh, cr critical medical equipment, laboratory equipment, had been destroyed or damaged beyond uh, use. But uh, despite this, thousands of survivors uh, huddled in the hospital, and most of them uh, uh, died uh, in the, out of 1,000 survivors that were there, 600 died in, in, the, in the days that followed the blast because they just were, could not get the medical attention that, w that, that was required. Well, in Oslo, we presented evidence about our uh, inability to respond as a humanitarian organization, uh, our inability as the ICRC, but then the, the inability of our movement, of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement, to provide an adequate humanitarian response in case of use of nuclear weapons. And this was done very scientifically on the basis of a major study that we published in 2009, so almost 10 years ago, in which uh, we assessed our own capabilities and those of other international agencies to provide uh, humanitarian assistance in case of use of nuclear weapons. And what we found is that uh, there, there is no uh, uh, adequate uh, capacity existing at national level uh, and none whatsoever in terms of international coordination at international level to respond to uh, a nuclear blast. And this is of grave concern indeed. Uh, and, and so the only adequate response is to, uh, to eliminate nuclear weapons, to prohibit and eliminate nuclear weapons. This is the ultimate way uh, uh, to, to prevent the humanitarian cat catastrophe that would ensue from the use of nuclear weapons and to which we and other agencies would just simply not be able to respond to. By the way, I should add that uh, the findings of our study uh, were corroborated in a similar study carried out a few years later by the uh, United Nations, UN agencies. Well, the, uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in, in May 2010 indeed uh, uh, made a historic finding. Uh, all of the states party to the Non-Proliferation Treaty agreed by consensus that any use of nuclear weapons would have catastrophic humanitarian consequences, and nuclear weapons must be considered through the lens of international humanitarian law. Now, we know from the decision, uh, the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice in 1996, that uh, any use of nuclear weapons would generally be contrary to international humanitarian law, also known as the law of armed conflict or the mm -hmm. laws of war. And this has been a conclusion of the ICRC and the global Red Cross and Red Crescent movement for many years now. For us, it's difficult to envisage any use of nuclear weapons that would be compatible with international humanitarian law. Uh, so this really grounded that this was one of the starting points for a historic statement by the president of the ICRC in April of 2010. So this is one month before the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference, in which he called on states 
to uh, begin negotiations for a legally binding international agreement to prohibit and eliminate nuclear weapons, not just on the basis of the fact that any use would be generally incompatible mm -hmm. with humanitarian law, but also crucially just on the basis of the evidence of the catastrophic humanitarian consequences and the inability of any uh, humanitarian assistance organization to be able to respond to such ca uh, catastrophe, to be able to meet mm -hmm. the magnitude of the humanitarian needs that would be generated by the use of nuclear weapons. Bear in mind as well, and this is in subsequent studies since 1945, uh, 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 modeling, environmental modeling has shown that even a limited nuclear exchange, this is using maybe just 100 average size nuclear weapons limited to a certain region, uh, certain regions in the world, so not necessarily a global exchange. If, these, if this nuclear exchange took place in particular in populated areas, the, uh, the environmental consequences would be such that it would lead to a, a, a cooling of, of global temperatures due to the, the massive amounts of materials, including um, radioactive particles uh, 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 shot up into the atmosphere from these blasts. And it would most probably lead to uh, food shortages and a probable famine by, uh, of, uh, of over one billion people. Now, th and this is just a fraction of the nuclear weapons in nuclear arsenals today. So uh, uh, once again, the evidence has been mounting over the last years. A lot of this evidence was indeed presented at the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons intergovernmental conferences that took place uh, starting in Oslo, but then later in Nayarit, Mexico, and in uh, Vienna, Austria. Uh, in 2013 and 2014, and that now, now we today have a massive body of evidence that a nuclear war would simp simply not uh, not only not be winnable, it would likely destroy life on Earth as we know it today. Yes, well, the, the ICRC and National Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies as part of our global movement, uh, humanitarian movement, we have welcomed the adoption of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, and we have, we have committed ourselves as a global movement to promoting its uh, entry into force and, and encouraging as many states as possible to join the treaty. We believe now uh, this treaty can really make a difference in terms of establishing a norm at global level very clearly and comprehensively prohibiting nuclear weapons and uh, reinforcing the stigma against the use of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So the treaty sends a clear signal to the world that, that any use of nuclear weapons, possession, development, uh, etc., is uh, completely unacceptable. And this madness has to stop. Uh, and, and, and we need to take decisive and concrete steps to end the era of nuclear weapons. And the nuclear ban treaty is a good step in the right direction. It is a concrete step in that direction. We believe it is a treaty that complements the nuclear uh, non-proliferation treaty. The NPT uh, commits states in Article 6 to nuclear disarmament, to effective measures towards nuclear disarmament. Unfortunately, there have, there's been very little uh, by way of concrete steps uh, under mm -hmm. Article 6, but we believe today there is that, that step through the nuclear ban treaty. And uh, we, we also believe that by reinforcing the stigma on nuclear weapons through the Nuclear Ban Treaty, this actually uh, uh, reinforces the NPT's non-proliferation objectives. Uh, it it, it create, creates an even greater disincentive for states to want to uh, uh, to develop uh, nuclear weapons and seek out nuclear weapons. Well, it's incredibly important that the people who want to do something and get involved, it's incredibly important through um, 
their own communities and any organizations or communities of interests that they, they work in, be it with youth organizations, the scientific community, teachers associations, um, uh, many people are also involved in public life at the local level uh, or at the national level for that matter in their countries to raise the issue, this, this uh, grave concern about the continued existence of nuclear weapons, critically about the rising risks of use mm -hmm. of nuclear weapons. We know that with increasing international tensions over recent years, it, with increasing rhetoric of certain world leaders who are actually either overtly or in, in, a, in, a, in a subtle but quite clear way threatening the use of nuclear weapons to say that this is completely unacceptable and that uh, 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 demand of governments that they take uh, uh, concrete steps and measures to reduce nuclear risks, reduce tensions, and concrete steps uh, towards nuclear disarmament. This is of interest to all communities. Mm -hmm. This is not an issue that is belongs only to uh, politicians or experts. Everyone is concerned about, uh, about nuclear weapons because nuclear weapons threaten the future of everyone. They threaten our children, our grandchildren, future generations, entire life on the planet. So everyone uh, is concerned and everyone has uh, uh, the legitimacy and a voice to bring uh, to debates about nuclear weapons. Well, I think today I draw my motivation just by looking back at what we've accomplished over the last eight years. If you look at just eight, ten, in the last eight, ten years, if, if you would have asked anyone, we're going to ban nuclear weapons through a new treaty, people didn't take us seriously. People said, oh, this is, a, um, this is utopic, it's unrealistic, it's not going to happen. Well, it did happen. Mm -hmm. It happened because we all pulled together, we worked together, everyone with their own, um, their, their own uh, expertise mm -hmm. and, and added value and so on. And certainly uh, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement brought its own uh, 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 contribution to this effort to ban nuclear weapons through it, it bringing its first-hand testimony mm -hmm. of what we saw in Hiroshima. Uh, the ICRC working side by side with the Japanese Red Cross back in 1945 uh, to do the best we could against all odds to bring relief to the dying and, 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 and wounded uh, I I the tens of thousands. Uh, we could hardly have an impact there and so based on our first-hand experience we were able to bring uh, uh, this testimony and succeed through this testimony in bringing about uh, a change in mindsets mm -hmm. of governments, of a critical mass of governments to turn things around and to s cease to look at nuclear weapons in narrow military and security terms but to broaden the perspective and indeed focus the perspective on what these weapons actually do. What is the evidence of what they do to human health, to people, to societies, and their long-term impacts on the environment and on future generations, and indeed the threat that they pose to future generations and to humanity as a whole. So it was bringing this um, uh, 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 this first-hand testimony of also of the, the long-term impacts mm -hmm. of nuclear weapons, the fact that the Japanese Red Cross is today continuing to treat survivors of the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, in fact, uh, in the five years that followed the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the number of fatalities, so the original number of fatalities mm -hmm. in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the, just the in 90, at the end of 1945, mm -hmm was 140,000 in Hiroshima and 70,000 in, in Nagasaki. Those figures uh, increased two, between two and threefold in the next five years due to radiation sickness mm -hmm. from radiation exposure. So people continue to die massively in the following five years. The medical system was incapable of responding to this, did not have the, the capacity to respond. And then later on, when the medical system uh, got up and working again in Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, through reconstructed hospitals, 
the Japanese Red Cross hospitals continued to treat thousands of survivors from the very high incidences of cancers, leukemia, and other diseases that followed. So for the decades on, now we're 73 years after the atomic bombings, and the remaining survivors, the Hibakusha, continue to suffer from these uh, cancers and illnesses and be treated by Japanese Red Cross hospitals. I'm feeling very optimistic when I see what we were able to achieve against all odds eight years ago. Uh, when we s embarked on this eight years ago, calling for uh, a new treaty to prohibit and limit nuclear weapons, and this uh, uh, the, this um, this groundswell that was created, uh, the, the, the work of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement with the ICRC, and then of course of civil society under the umbrella of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, and a range of states and in building support among a critical mass of states to, uh, to negotiate the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. So this gives me a lot of optimism that we can, we can do a lot more. Right. It's going to take a lot of hard work and dedication, mm -hmm. but we are committed to doing it, to seeing the, the ban treaty enter into force and seeing a majority of states join, and in the meantime, creating the necessary pressures on nuclear weapon states and their allies to take urgent action to, at the very least, urgently right now, uh, reduce nuclear risks take the needed steps to reduce the risk of use of nuclear weapons to prevent their use and then and then ultimately taking uh, fulfilling their promises mm -hmm. of nuclear disarmament by taking the concrete action uh, needed